Coming up, a young mom experiences the death of her child, but never loses faith in God, and a prodigal story of returning to faith. Welcome to 700 Club Canada. And before we begin today, I just want to wish all of the mums out there a happy Mother's Day this weekend. We know that there are many moms who are currently juggling a lot, right? With kids at home or full-time jobs. So we hope that you're able to take a moment for yourselves this Sunday. You all certainly deserve it. On today's program, you'll meet one young mom whose journey has been anything but easy. You know, we first met Liz in Vancouver just over a year ago, and she's here today to update us on her incredible story. But first, this is Liz's painful and profound journey of faith and motherhood. Watch this. I remember sitting on the edge of the bathtub, just kind of staring at it and not really sure, you know, how long is this supposed to take? But almost instantly I watched as there was this little, this little pink plus sign on the pregnancy test. Liz was 21 years old when she married her college sweetheart. Their plan was to wait five years before starting a family. So when I found out I was pregnant, I was completely shocked, um, very much overwhelmed by the way that my life was gonna change. It wasn't what I had expected. It wasn't what we'd planned and yet Having so recently prayed for God's direction, his hand just felt like it was wrapped over the whole thing. At eight weeks, Liz had her first ultrasound. And I remember just physically shaking going in there because I knew when we see this baby on the screen, like this is real. And the technician looks at me and she asked me if twins run in our family. And so I made some joke and, you know, just tried to brush it off, tried to brush off the nerves. And she looks at me and she says, well, Here's baby A, and here's baby B. Additional news revealed that the boys were identical twins and could be at higher risk for twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome, which means the boys shared blood vessels and blood flow. But we had no signs of that at all, and so nothing showed up in any of our ultrasounds. There were no warning signs of anything that was to come, and everything just looked really perfect. Liz began to plan for her boy's arrival, and she and her husband decided on their names. We had Alistair, uh, who was our little, he was very serious. He was kind of stuck in the same spot the whole time, and he, um, he didn't really move. He was very serious, determined to be the firstborn. And then we had Landon, who was, we called him our little monkey, because he was constantly flipping around and moving and very active. At 30 weeks, Liz went for a routine checkup and everything was fine, everything was perfect, um, same as it had been for the entire pregnancy. Two days later, I woke up and was just feeling a little bit off. Um, I thought I'd picked up a bug or something and I wasn't really sure what it was. We were scheduled to have our maternity photos and so I kind of wondered if I should just push it off and reschedule, but I knew that the boys could come at any time. So there was just that something in the back of my mind that said, no, you need to do this. The feelings persisted, and then the boys stopped their active movement. And so we said, we'll just monitor it for another 24 hours, and you know, maybe they're just having a slow day, you know, they're getting squished in there, things are tighter, they're not, you know, moving with the big movements that they're usually moving with. And so we called the hospital, didn't even hesitate. They said, just come in. And they check us in, and as they're taking us in to examine, uh, examine me, I feel this just big stomach kick. And I knew it was from Landon because I knew where he was positioned. And I thought to myself, oh, we came in for nothing. Like, this is what I've been waiting for for the past three days. Now they're gonna wake up and move and they're just, the hospital's just gonna send us home and think we're, you know, overreacting. And what I didn't know at that time, I didn't know at that time that that was the last time that I would ever feel Landon move. As doctors monitored the baby's heart rates, Landon's heart rate continued to drop. Liz was prepped for an emergency C-section. And so I remember feeling the cool rush 
of the medicine and going through my arm and having them count me down from 10. And the last thing I remember thinking is, God, I place the three of us in your hands. And there was nothing else I could do in that moment. I had, you know, I was fighting as hard as I could for my boys, but in that moment, it was all up to God and it was all in his hands. While waking up in the recovery room, Liz could only think of one thing to say. I just remember kind of slurring the word twins, and that was kind of all I could even say in that moment. It was just twins, twins. And the nurse kind of just looked at me, and she said, you know, we're going to bring your husband in. And I got that kind of sinking, sinking feeling in my heart. And Andreas came in, and he just looked at me, and he said, honey, we lost Landon. So the nurse brought in Landon and I got to hold him. He was wrapped in this little green blanket and his body was still warm. And I just held him and I cried over him. And I prayed for a miracle. I prayed that his heart would start beating, that his breath, you know, lungs would start breathing. And we didn't get that miracle, but we got moments to say goodbye to him and we got to hold him and we got to love him even in death, even in his stillness. And so looking back at it a few days later, I realized that that was his kick goodbye to me. And that was his way of saying, it's okay, mommy. I'm going somewhere that is so much better. And I'm going to be in the arms of someone who loves me so much. Doctors confirmed that the boys had developed acute twin-to-twin -twin transfusion. They said that if we'd waited another 12 hours to come in, we probably would have lost Alistair as well. I knew, though, looking back, that God's hand had been so clearly over the whole pregnancy that his hand had to be in this too. And so there was great comfort in knowing that he hadn't left us in this moment, he hadn't abandoned us in this moment, and that even though I couldn't necessarily see him right now, I couldn't see how he was working, I couldn't see what tomorrow held, I knew that I could still trust him with today. And that's not an easy place to get to. You know, you, <laughs> you get there some days and then you take two steps back and you wrestle with it all over again. And you, you know, you cry and you sob and you wail and you mourn and you grieve and it hurts. It hurts so deeply. And yet in that place of complete brokenness, you have to turn to Christ. You have to realize that you can't do this on your own and that there is hope and that there is comfort offered there. Just trusting him and knowing that these little ones are in his hands and whether I get to bring them home from the hospital or not, they are safe and they are being held just as I am being held in this moment too. What a beautiful story. I just love that. And now we're privileged to welcome the author of Embrace, Clinging to Christ Through the Pain of Pregnancy, Loss, and blogger at Mummy Manigrin, Liz Manigrin. Thank you for joining us today, Liz. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Well, well, what a powerful story. And I know that you're encouraging and helping so many people by sharing your story. So can you briefly share about the additional miscarriages and the grief that accompanied it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we had our, our first loss, obviously, was a, a stillborn. And a couple of years after that, we decided to start trying again to expand our family. And the doctors at that point had told us nothing to worry about, you know, the first pregnancy loss was just twin related. And so I went into the pregnancy again, quite naive, thinking everything was gonna be okay. And I was eight weeks pregnant when we had our first miscarriage. Oh. We lost that little baby. And so really good. over the course of the next year, it was just loss after loss after loss. And we had a, a second miscarriage at 11 weeks around Christmas time that year. The following year, we lost another baby again at eight weeks. And then almost exactly a year from our first miscarriage, uh, we had our fourth miscarriage at five weeks. Wow. And so 
over the course of that three year period, we, we lost five babies. And it was just really, like I said, just loss after loss after loss, grief yeah. um, compounded upon grief. Oh my goodness. I mean, that that is so difficult. And I know there's those watching that even one miscarriage is just such a loss. So can't imagine, you know, the grief that you both were experiencing and you began writing to help process the grief. So tell us about blogging and how it has helped you and how it's helping other grieving moms. Yeah, I started blogging as yeah as a way to work through what I was feeling. At the time, six years ago when I started writing, there wasn't a lot of other information out there about what grief actually looked like after a pregnancy loss. Right. And so I started sharing our story as a way to not only yeah work through the different, so many different layers as to what I was feeling and going through, but also to show those around me that you know, grief is normal and this is what grief looks like. It's raw and it's messy and there's bits that pop up even, you know, years later or little triggers here and there. And along the way, I encountered just so many incredible relationships. And I found this really beautiful community that I never knew existed. This mm -hmm. community of, of those who had experienced the shared loss and the shared grief and who were able, you know, we were just able to partner together um, and and feel less alone in our own journeys. Yeah, you know, that's what's so beautiful about when sharing your story, right? God yes. just welcomes people to be on the journey with you and you get to be on the journey with them. That's beautiful. And you've written a book now called Embrace. What was the motivation for writing it? And, and what's the takeaway for readers? So I started writing Embrace around kind of just before our second miscarriage. I started feeling just those those God whispers in my heart. I was saying, you know, it's time to take the blog and to put it into something a little bit more final and to really get it out there into the hands of those um, who are who are freshly grieving. And I mean, another another big part of the book is really just support mm -hmm. and how do we how do we walk through each and every layer of grief in a way that reflects Christ and that draws us closer to him? And for those around us, for friends and family members, for pastors, or for those who are choosing to walk alongside of us in this grief as well, how do they support us? How do they love us best in this really messy place? Yeah, well, you know what? I think I'm really glad that you're talking about this because like you said, six years ago, not a lot of people were talking about the grief of miscarriage. And it yeah. was kind of that, you know, almost a quiet grief. But can you yeah. help us understand then, how do we support somebody who is experiencing miscarriage? Because that is something that maybe we all feel a little, we're not sure what to do. What would it look like? Yeah, I think the difficulty is, you know, you don't want to, sometimes it's difficult to know what to say mm -hmm. and you don't want to cause more pain or more, more grief by, by speaking out or by, by, you know, acting out. Um, but I think the important thing is just to remember that these little babies were so loved and yes. that they are forever carried in this, in this mother's heart, in this family. And so to not be afraid to, to say their name, to not be afraid to ask um, the mother how she's doing, um, to really open yourself up to hearing the stories and to being prepared to, to just cry together, to not have to have the right words or to not have to know all the things that you need to say, but to just really be there, to just really show up and say, I don't know what to do. I, I haven't been through this situation myself, or, or maybe I have, but my situation looks quite different. Um, but I'm here for you no matter what you need, and I will always remember this little baby with you. You know, I love that, Liz, because I really think it gives permission then for people to share their loss. And what would yeah. you say to, to women who maybe have experienced miscarriage, but they have never shared their loss, and they're carrying this grief all mm -hmm. by themselves? What would you say to them? Yeah, I, I would just say that there is such freedom in Christ to grieve these earliest of losses. And as we share our stories, it is such a beautiful testimony to his faithfulness throughout the whole journey. And we do, we find that community, we find that support from other moms who said, I've been there and 
I know that right now it is a really dark space. I know that right now it is heavy and you don't know uh, if you're ever going to feel like you did before this loss, mm -hmm. but there is hope even here, even in the midst of this, there is still hope. Yeah. And so I think it's obviously a very personal decision as to whether we decide to share our babies and our stories with the world. Uh, but when we do, I believe there is, there is great freedom there yeah. and a great sense of community and, and support and love. Well, they certainly could find it by connecting to you and your book. What's the update on your family? Yeah, so we, uh, since the miscarriages, we had a little baby girl. She's our rainbow baby. That's what we call a baby born after a miscarriage or a stillbirth. And then actually just last year, we had another baby. We had a little pandemic baby. Wow. And so, uh, yeah, our family is 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 growing we have we have three three lovely children here in my arms and uh, wow. i always say i'm a mama i'm a mama to eight so. wow well thank you again for sharing your story you've encouraged us again today and god bless your family and your ministry and this book embrace may many people find it and read it uh thank you liz you can find out more about liz and her book at 700club.ca we'll be right back with a powerful story of redemption for one young man who lost his way let the Word of God transform you as you listen to God is For Us. Verses of salvation, peace, and victory. Read by Pat Robertson. These powerful verses from Romans will build your faith. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Call now to get your copy of God is For Us. Available now. I was born and raised in Southern California, Orange County specifically. I grew to love skateboarding and going to the beach and surfing, swimming. You know, sometimes teachers, they would like to single me out because of who my dad was. They would say, oh, Jonathan, I'd expect more from you, seeing as who your dad was. And you know, when you're a, you're a young kid, you, you take that to heart. People are expecting more from you. I just wanted to be like everybody else. I just wanted to blend in. But growing up around my mom and dad, I can tell you one thing's for sure, I was never able to doubt the existence of God. I recognized that they had a true relationship with Jesus Christ and he had a great love for his family and I always knew that. As the age of innocence was lost, I began to resent this question. They would ask me, obviously, are you gonna grow up to be a preacher like your father? I wanted to be known as Jonathan Laurie, not as the son of Greg Laurie, not as the son of the famous pastor and evangelist. I wanted to be known as my own person. So when I was 16, a friend persuaded me to try smoking marijuana with him for the first time. Let's fast forward six months now. I'm getting high three, five times a day. I'm now uh, drinking alcohol as well, smoking cigarettes. As I continued to live this lifestyle of smoking marijuana and living at home with my parents, I found myself living a double life. I was lying to everybody. See, the very thing I was running from, my friends were identifying me that at parties I would go to. I think there's some humor in that on God's part. <laughs> Successfully lied to my parents for about a year. When I was 17, I was, uh, I was in a parking lot down in Newport with a couple friends. Um, we were standing around my car in a parking lot at like 11 o'clock at night. It was a Friday night, and we were smoking pot. That's a real smart place to do illicit things, right? Well, sure enough, a cop car rolls up. He busts us. I get arrested. I get a possession for marijuana, and, you know, my parents had no idea. I had to come and tell them point blank what I had been up to for the past year and a half or so now. It was tough. So as a result, they put me on restriction. They took away my car, uh, my friends, no surfing, no going outside, no skateboarding, you know, nothing, just mom and dad time. But before I told them, I told my brother Christopher. I told him what had happened. He prayed for me. He encouraged me to seek accountability and to get new Christian friends. He told me of his own problems of drug use and lies. He said that it was a lifestyle of temporary fulfillment and it was empty. So after a few months of being grounded, I started to get some privileges back. I earned some trust. 
And what did I do? I immediately went back to those old friends and I got back right where I left off. I was back to smoking pot more than ever. I was viewing pornography regularly. I was partying all the time. I was drinking underage, whatever. Whatever was around, I would do it. You know, looking back, I can really only think one thing and that's that God had grace on me because there was people right alongside me doing the exact same things. I knew guys that got DUIs, got STDs, got girls pregnant, knew girls that got abortions. I knew guys that got felonies, they got arrested, that are in jail. I had a friend, he was a close friend of mine. Before he went to sleep one night, he ingested a lethal amount of heroin and died in his sleep. Another friend of mine attempted to commit suicide. This was supposed to be fun. For six years, I lived this life, um, this life of deceit and lies and the continual ignorance of the gospel. You know, as a result, I became increasingly isolated, lonely, depressed. I was isolated because I didn't fit in with either crowd. I had too much of the world to be happy in the church. I had too much of the church to be happy in the world. Some nights after partying, I'd be driving home and I'd look over my passenger seat and I'd see the bag of drugs sitting next to me. I decided I'd want to quit. I did this a number of times. I'd be driving home, I'd roll my window down, I'd grab that baggie and I'd fling it out the window. I'd go to bed that night feeling pretty good about myself, thinking, hey, I just, you know, I'm quitting. Starting tomorrow, I'm, I'm gonna be clean. And uh, I'd go to bed feeling pretty good. And that next morning, I'd wake up, I'd get in my car, I'd go find the spot that I threw that baggie out. I'd go back over to it, I'd pick it up, brush it off. It was usually run over by a couple cars. Sometimes it was wet, smashed, and gross. And I'd bring that baggie back into my life. I was addicted. I was never really fully honest with anybody, but the one person that I did share with more than anyone was my brother Christopher. One day we were driving in the car, and he looked over at me, and after sharing some stuff that had been going on in my life, he asked me, Jonathan, what's it gonna take? You see, we were talking about giving my life to Christ. He asked me what it was gonna take, and I don't remember what my response was. I probably blew it off to some degree. I probably said something along the lines of, you know, oh, I'm just having fun, I'm not hurting anybody, I've got all the time in the world. So while I don't remember what my answer was that day, his question really stuck with me. On a Thursday morning at my job, my boss came to me and he asked me how everything was going. The boss happened to be a friend of our family, and he asked me how my day was going. I responded, it was pretty good. And then uh, he showed back up again uh, about an hour later with a police officer friend of ours also. They told me at that point that I, I should come with them. I should, I need to go home. When we got into my neighborhood, we rounded the corner. I looked in front of my house and I saw my father weeping. And I saw him collapse on the ground in front of our house. I didn't know what to make of it. As I got out of the car, a friend of ours got up and walked up to me, grabbed me by the shoulder, looked me in the eyes and told me, Jonathan Christopher died. There's a different sunrise. I felt vacant. I was vacant. I didn't know how to respond to it. My only brother was gone. The only person I was ever truly honest with now wasn't on earth anymore. After everybody had left our house, things began to settle and I really began to wonder what this meant. Instantly, Christopher's words popped back into my head. What's it gonna take? What's it gonna take for you to give your life to Christ? And I knew what I had to do. I went into my room, I grabbed my drugs, my alcohol, pornography, cigarettes, whatever. You see, I still was hiding everything from my parents. So I had all kinds of hiding spots. I put it all on my bed in front of me. And I asked Christ to come into my heart. I prayed for him to forgive me. I prayed for him to not only take the addiction away from me, but the desire to do these things as well. And he's been faithful to do that. So today I'm, uh, I'm married to the girl I, I had a crush on in junior high and high school. My wife and I have two children together. We've got another one on the way. God's blessed me more than I ever could have imagined. That's what the Lord can do. He can change anybody if you just give him an open heart. You see, I gave my life to Christ not because people wanted me to or didn't want me to. I did it because I wanted the hope of heaven. I wanted the hope of seeing my brother again. I wanted the hope of being reunited with family and friends. I wanted to see Jesus face to face. As Christians, we have the hope of heaven, not the hope of a life without sadness. See, God can use these things to bring us closer to him. Hey, to God be the glory.
don't know about you, but I've really been reminded in today's show that God is eternal. Uh, he, he has the big picture. He sees the long range view of our lives. That's why we can trust him. That's why we can put our hope in him. Even when we don't understand what's happening today, I was really reminded of that when I was speaking with, to Liz today. She's experienced a lot of loss, but look what God has done with her story. I mean, she shared with our, her story with us a while back now she's written a book and God just continues to use her pain, her journey and her story, multiply it in the lives of others. See, God's a great mathematician. He's always about multiplication. That's because he's eternal. He has the big picture. So whatever it is today, you can trust him. You can bring it to him. He sees the beginning from the end. So don't hold back on him because he's not holding back on you. If you need prayer today, if you'd like to join us and partner with us, we have a wonderful gift for you. It's called God is for us. It's actually Pat Robertson reading the book of Romans to us, one of my favorites. If you'd like to join us in partnership monthly or even just for prayer, call us at 1-855-759-759. 0700 or go on 700club.ca and we'll uh, answer your request there. Henry sent a request in saying, please pray for salvation of my father and his new wife. You got it, Henry. And Roxanne said, please pray for my son. He's 10 years old and in a new school and he's having a hard time making connections. Well, would you pray along with me as I bring these requests to a God in heaven who sees it all? Father, I bring Henrik's request to you. We pray for salvation for his father and his new wife. We pray for salvation through this whole family that your kingdom would come to this family. And Lord, I pray for this little 10 year old boy. Would you just be so present with him and give him the courage that he needs. May he trust in you even in his new school and may he grow up to be a man of great faith. In Jesus name, amen. I love John 5 24. It says very truly, I tell you, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. You can trust God with anything. Thanks for watching. To contact us, visit 700club.ca.